data scientist at TEG Analytics. And as part of my duties, uh, the, obviously the first one is solutioning to create components um, on the, the statistics and math components which actually go into the solutions that we create for our clients. And uh, we work with the uh, AI ML algorithms and that's also why we are excited to be a part of the MLDS over here. We work with uh, IoT, we work with uh, advanced tech stacks to bring all our models into fruition so that they can help our clients with their business. One part of that, one part of my uh, work is on the solutioning side, but the other part which I really am kicked about and which I'm part of is the mentoring and the training part. So there are so many eager young minds who enter this industry and TEG uh, pretty much specializes in taking people who may not have a hardcore data science experience. Right? So we pick up people who have that basic ability to analyze and to think and uh, irrespective of the domain that they've been working on a basic engineering degree and we bring them into TEG and we groom them to be data scientists. So uh, that is something that I really enjoy doing, the mentoring and bringing people up to speed and empowering them so that you know they understand data science and machine learning and AI and they're able to contribute constructively to the So definitely the industry is trending towards AI ML. And I would like to take a step back over here. So someone who's, you know, I've been watching this industry for pretty much the past 15 years. Uh, and I was involved with, uh, you know, machine learning before it got christened as machine learning, right? From the time it was taught in, as econometrics and statistics in school, right? So what has happened is we are doing a lot more of predictive because people are now no longer interested in understanding why things work. They just want answers. You know, the pretty much the horse race analogy that's used. Earlier I wanted to know whether I should assess a horse based on speed or performance or capability, you know, those kinds of parameters. Now I just want to know which horse will win, right? So the questions that we were asking earlier are only to answer which horse should I bet on. Which means that the tools that we had earlier were for large data sets. We did not have computing power. We did not have a big data environment which allowed us to actually process all that data. So we were asking questions which were based on aggregates. Right? We were asking questions based on uh, what are the particular parameters which will help predict performance. What are the parameters or what are the kinds of uh, customer attributes uh, which will help me segment customers. Now with the confluence of big data, processing power is getting cheaper every day, right? And we just have so much of data around us. We have data streaming in from every different source, right? So what happens is when this data meets this compute power, right? It's possible for us to go back and do insights on each and every individual, which is really why we are talking about AIML now. We are not talking about the descriptors. We are not talking about the predictives. We are now talking simply about the prescriptives. Just tell me which customer to target. It's not even a customer segment. Which individual customer do I need to target? And that is the kind of power that AIML is bringing because of all these associated events, you know, uh, the big data cluster independently evolved, the data sources independently evolved, but now we are in a position to harness all of that. So AIML now is stable stakes, right? You need to have it. But at the same time, something else I would like to add over here, the advent of AI ML means that people have sort of stepped away from domain knowledge, right? What is happening is this, uh, right now I see a trend where people are applying AI ML pretty much blindly to the problem that they have at hand. And at, at a junior analyst level or someone who's entering the industry, it's very tempting to learn the models, but divorce them from the domain. I'm not sure that that is you know, the way the industry will proceed. We will have this domain knowledge which is now built into these very domain specific AI ML models and that's probably how I see the industry evolving. So absolutely, when you look at it from a snapshot view as of today, you know, we have a stock and a flow concept, right? When you take it as stock of data scientists at this point in time, Definitely we have a shortage because we don't have as many women even around you. How many women do you see compared to men, right? But when you look at it as something which has been evolving over time, the absence of data scientists in this particular domain is not simply because people don't want to come into data science, women don't want to look at data science as an option. It is because from our school levels, from our engineering college levels, 
from our other, you know, uh, the feeder system into the data science profile itself, that has a lower percentage of women. So I think what we see here is a manifestation of that, right? And I think that is also improving because the moment our feeder systems start improving, you see more girls in engineering colleges right now than I ever saw when I was in college, right? So obviously that is improving. And data science is one industry where you should not have some kind of a gender bias at all. I mean, if anything, it's one of the easiest industries for women to get into, provided they are interested in STEM. And I think women also probably don't network as well as their male colleagues do. Right? So, uh, initiatives by AI in terms of making sure that women networks are growing and women at the you know, entry level data science women networks are growing, that is really important. I think even in Kaggle, the number of women that we see participating is actually not as high as the men. Right? So we need to have that kind of support structure for women to come forward and to participate in these competitions and to take time out from you know, what they are doing. Uh, another feeder, excellent feeder that we're talking about is people who worked in IT systems and who want to move into data science. There also the number of women who want to switch over from IT to data science is low. I think we need to have these kinds of support systems which enable them to, you know, sort of overcome the natural risk aversion. And that's where I see, you know, uh, AIM kind of playing a role. Definitely something that's important. Uh, I'm going to answer this question at two levels. One is it's very easy for me to read out a list of tools and say that this is where you need to invest, right? So if you're going to look at that, I would say you look at uh, your Keras, you look at your, pretty much every platform has a deep learning module that they have integrated into the platform. So if you're doing, a, you definitely need to know cloud technologies, you need to know big data, you need to know your uh, stack pretty well. So data science is no longer about sitting there and coding in Python or in R. It's also knowing about where, you know, the larger the data, the more you have to do optimization on the cloud. So it's about knowing a lot of other things apart from your traditional R and Python and uh, other coding tools that you would use. So I think what we take off is definitely a cloud orientation is needed. So you need to have something from AWS, Microsoft, GCP as part of your profile. The second is you need to have knowledge of a big data stack, start with Hadoop, you know, go over to uh, probably Cassandra, Kubernetes, whichever is the particular thing that you want to use. And you need to have knowledge of the coding tools also, right, your uh, Python and your R, because a lot of work still happens on that. Uh, I think it's up to each person to figure out the recipe and the mix of things that they want to put on their plate. But there's another aspect to this answer. I think it's not so much which tools we want to invest in 2019, but it's also for us to be able to see, not, not to be scared of learning a new tool, right? Which means that what people say when they look at R and Python is say, this is a completely different language. I don't think we should look at it that way. We should look at the commonalities which are there in the languages and in the tools we use and leverage those commonalities. And that's something which I have a challenge when you know, and I'll start learning a new tool. Yeah, I think this has been a very exciting uh, uh, you know, event. And uh, the speakers list the kinds of topics which are being discussed over here. I think there's definitely a need for this kind of uh, developer orientation summit where people are more focused on, uh, I, I mean, as opposed to a client marketing kind of summit or a domain knowledge summit, here this is a lot more of focus on the tools and on the, uh, you know, other support structure which is available. So definitely there's a need for this.